Hi, everyone. My name is Noor Fahmi. I am a steering committee member at ACE. For those of you guys who don't know us, um, ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, and products. We host free live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various subject areas. To see more, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. We currently have 14 different streams that are focused on various ML topics, and this session is in Math and Foundation Stream. Hope you enjoy it and come back. Um, today, we have Professor Mark Vanderlen from University of Berkeley, who is also Professor of Biostatistics there, um, to present targeted machine learning. Okay, yes. Thank you very much for the introduction. So today I'll talk about targeted learning, the bridge from machine learning to statistical and causal inference. And this involves uh, uh, joint work with uh, various of my uh, PhD students, such as Rachel Phillips, Ivana, Melanika, uh, Aurelien Bibau, and so on. Let's see, why is it not going to the next page? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so I've, let's first talk a little bit about uh, the motivation for uh, a field like targeted learning. And, and one of the motivations is the uh, problems with the traditional statistical methodology, uh, you know, typically based on parametric models. Uh, it also represents a particular way of doing statistics, which is very recipe oriented. Uh, for example, this is like a uh, typical thing you might find in, in, in a kind of a textbook where they give you advice of what kind of analysis to do based on the type of data you have. For example, if you have right sensor data, you use, uh, can use Kaplan-Meier or cox perot hazards. And if you have binary outcomes, you use logistic regression and so on. Very uh, not involving any kind of real interaction with truly understanding the experiment which generate the data even though that is so fundamental uh, to statistics and also not really any interaction with the, your collaborators about what is the question of interest. Uh, on top of that, uh, there, even when you believe these parametric models, such as linear regression or logistic regression, um, of you, that you think they're reasonable approaches, uh, they have uh, generally very poor properties if it comes to type one error control and confidence intervals. And that's due to the uh, misspecification of these models. So, for example, if you care about a causal effect of, let's say, a treatment, binary treatment choice on some uh, future outcome, and it's in, like an observational study where you have confounders, then uh, you might say, okay, I'm going to run, uh, let's say, some binary outcomes. So I'm going to run a logistic regression. I have treatment in my model, and I'm going to adjust for confounders by putting them in as main terms. But the problem is you're really then only adjusting uh, partially uh, in a very minor way uh, for the actual measured confounders because you could have included them as squares, you could have included them as any kind of basis function. And really, one chooses only one term. One also often avoids even interaction between treatment because you know that gives more problematic interpretations with the coefficients. So, uh, so in a sense, in every way it's misspecified so that even when the true uh, effect, for example, would be zero, you would be picking a bias. Uh, and in general, uh, the confidence model will get narrower and narrower around the wrong answer. And so the coverage will actually converge to zero uh, with traditional uh, methods. Similarly, uh, when you test the null hypothesis, null hypothesis of no causal effect of this treatment, for example, you would end up using this kind of logistic regression, you would end up with a method which, as sample size increases, the probability of falsely rejecting the null converges to one. If that's already pretty bad, uh, but it's actually worse because people really don't a priori specify these parametric models because they wouldn't know how to specify them a priori because they, you, so what usually happens is they will go through several rounds of choosing particular uh, ways of adjusting for covariates and interactions they include. And uh, 
And if the results are not really what they expected, then probably they have to try a few more of such models and, and eventually they might converge to something which they think looks reasonable. And then it gets published as if this was an a priori specified uh, regression model. So in this case, there's actually human intervention uh, in the actual selection of the model. So there is no way the inference of the p-values of the problems model can even be correct. It's impossible. And um, we also don't have any way of recovering from that because we don't even know what the estimation procedure precisely was. So that's uh, so let's represent it here by saying, <coughs> is this your machine learning system? You pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Just stir the pile until they start looking right. So this has been noticed by many that, uh, for example, John Ioninus wrote already early on papers about why most published research findings are false. Is another few few uh, papers, uh, false positive psychology, undisclosed flexibility in data collection and analysis, allows presenting anything as significant, and the statistical crisis in science, data dependent analysis, a garden of forking paths, explains why many statistically significant comparisons don't hold up. So what's the role of target learning? Uh, target learning follows a, a very careful scientific uh, roadmap. And, uh, and that is kind of represented here uh, by this kind of uh, yeah, the picture. It's, it's the first step is you have to define what you really care about. And that's where modeling comes in. And when I say modeling, it's often things like structural causal models or uh, or also kind of ways of uh, you know sensor data modeling where you define the full data your desired data of interest first uh, like in causal models that represents <coughs> defining uh, potential outcomes so for example for every subject you say there's an outcome under treatment and outcome under control and i am thinking of that as this underlying full data and given that i could define now for example, the mean outcome under control, the mean outcome under treatment, and take the difference. That will be like an average treatment effect. But you can also look at other interventions. You can have more, and so on. So there, this is uh, what causal, structural causal models are about. They allow you to define formally causal effects of an intervention on an outcome uh, for all kinds of uh, studies and data structures. Uh, so in that case, you have to find through this type of uh, modeling, you have to find your causal quantity of interest. This can be done in, in interaction, obviously, with your collaborators. And it gives them also a language that they can understand. And then comes the next question, which is identification. Can we identify this causal quantity uh, or this kind of full data uh, target parameter? Can we identify it from the observed data distribution? Because we don't observe typically the kind of desired data. There's always something like missingness or censoring or bias sampling or all these uh, things which can happen as part of the experiment, which means you have to link your observed data to the underlying full data. Like in a typical simple causal model, you would say, oh, what I observe is one of the potential outcomes, namely the outcome under the treatment the person took, and the other one is missing. So it becomes a missing data problem, and that's typical of how causal inference uh, problems are formulated. So then the question is, can we learn from the observed data, which is like censored or missing data on the desired data, can we actually identify from the observed data probability distribution the quantity of interest? Now, that's an identification problem. There are results for that that relies on some assumptions, such as in causal inference, the randomization assumption or the sequential randomization assumption or instrumental variable assumptions. There are all these different types of identification results. So at that point, you can specify this estimate. So that's that actual feature of the probability distribution of the data, which equals your causal quantity of interest under assumptions which are specified. Now, if you like these assumptions, then you can say, I move on. And if you say that's impossible, that's never true, then and you're, you don't really succeed in finding yet an estimate which is reasonable and approximates well uh, what you care about. But let's say you do. 
uh, then you have to find to find an estimate now. And so you can see there this this gap between the causal question and this estimate that's called a causal gap. That something has nothing to do with the data. That's purely to do with these typically non-testable assumptions. Uh, to what degree they are true. And uh, if they will be true, there will be no gap. So now the estimation problem is essentially defined. You have to find your estimate. You can also talk about what do you know about your probability this your data, about your experiment. So there might be some knowledge there. You want to use that too. And then you say, OK, I now need to construct an estimator. Now that uh, estimate will depend on things like, you know, think about the data being ordered in time. So you can you can put good write down the likelihood of the data as a product over time of conditional distributions of a future variable given the past. <coughs> and your statistical estimate will depend on some of these conditional distributions of a future variable given the past. And so they will have to be learned from the data. And so that's where machine learning is a natural candidate. Uh, because your statistical model will not make assumptions such as parametric forms, so you have to kind of let the data speak on learning these stochastic relations. Uh, so there, we, as part of target learning, we, we use this so-called super learning uh, as a way to combine all the machine learning algorithms into one uh, powerful library, and then you let the cross-validation through an internal competition decide what is the best algorithm to use for this particular data set you can theoretically prove that that is actually the optimal strategy and methodology for learning these stochastic relations. So when you would now plug them in into your estimate, you would get an answer. However, that's still not good enough because these estimates, these plug-in estimates uh, based on machine learning fits, they are actually not following real theory yet. They are not behaving. They don't have a sampling distribution, which is normal yet. And they also have a bias, which is usually larger than uh, one over the square root of sample size, meaning that typical confidence interval based on just variance estimation will actually not have the right coverage. So that's where TMLE comes in. That's target maximum likelihood estimation or target minimum loss estimation in a more general way. Uh, is provides that ex extra step that after you have computed these uh, prediction functions, these uh, using, let's say, the state of the art of machine learning, you still need to do an extra fitting step, but now that extra fitting step is based on choosing a parametric model which uses offset your current machine learning fit and then has a little fluctuation parameter, just like a coefficient in a parametric model. And that parametric model is chosen very clever so that a little change in that coefficient, that fluctuation, uh, corresponds to a maximal change in, this, in the estimate. And thereby, if you do a little mix of likelihood with this parametric model, you are actually using the you are using the data to purely fit that estimate. So that's why target mix of likelihood, uh, you know, really has drastic implications for the whole behavior of the estimator. And number one, it, it removes a lot of bias, so that the bias becomes asymptotically negligible, and also it starts behaving like a normal sampling distribution. So you start can have theory now, and you can have inference. And that's why we refer to target mix like you know, as the bridge for machine learning to statistical inference. And so now you have your best statistical estimate, and you can also accurately now quantify uncertainty. And so that's uh, the general story of target mix and likelihood, and as combined with super learning as a way, and that's the role it plays in uh, data science. Now, target learning is not like uh, that new anymore. It, we start this started in. Uh, with an article in 2006, and since then a lot of research has evolved from it, a lot of applications. It's really in general template, target maximum like estimation, target learning. Uh, and so it can be used for any statistical estimation problem to develop these state-of-the-art, efficient, optimal machine learning algorithms. In 2011, we wrote our first book, uh, The Causal Inference for Observational and Experimental Data. And in 2018, we wrote another uh, book. And these books have a lot of contributions from people active in this, in this field. Uh, and that, um, and the other book, the latest book is Target Learning in Data Science. We also have a lot of software developments. Uh, there's also a book coming up with uh, Chapman and Hall, uh, 
about the software we have developed, uh, which is in TLverse and SL3, it's in, in R, uh, with lots of target learning tools people can use. And also other people have the, and the idea is that people just contribute to this. In addition, uh, many people are nowadays applying target learning, uh, also have very high profile studies. Uh, so like the articles in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, for example, here, the HIV testing and treatment with the use of community health approach in rural Africa, involving a community randomized trial where we use team and uh, combined with super learning, uh, even for very small sample size, but if you do it accurately, and you can do this. Uh, genetic uh, diverse and protective efficacy uh, of the malaria vaccine by Peter Gilbert and so on. Also involving the use of TMLE, uh, robust machine learning, variable importance analysis of medical conditions of healthcare spending by Sherry Rose. Uh, really, uh, you know, comparing these traditional methods for in which they was done before and now the target learning and some drastic differences and really changing the way these uh, medical conditions are scored for healthcare spending. Uh, Lancet articles. Uh, and uh, here's just another example, uh, but it demonstrates the kind of complex uh, statistical estimation problems you can solve with targeted learning. For example, uh, this is work by Romain Neugebauer using Kaiser Permanente uh, data where they're interested in understanding how to treat diabetes patients and in particular comparing different dynamic regimens uh, for controlling glucose and what the impact is on death and, and other time to event outcomes. And uh, and here you see on the right uh, with TMLE uh, estimating the survival curve under four different uh, regimens from very intense control, like whenever it falls below uh, uh, six, you already start intensifying the treatment. Of above six, you start intensifying treatment and whenever it starts below six and a half, seven and so on. And so you see that uh, the more uh, aggressively you control glucose level, the better your survival. And this, these are studies where you collect longitudinal data over patients. They are, you know, they, they drop out and they drop out in response to, so they're censoring. Uh, they drop out in response to time-dependent covariates. The treatment is informed by time-dependent covariates, so they're so-called time-dependent confounding. So it has all the complications of real-world data. And still you can do all these, uh, ask these exciting questions, which you cannot even do with traditional methods and, and actually get uh, solid answers. Can you guide me through the, the different colored lines on the graph on the right? Yeah, so this, these are, this is a survival curve. So this will be the probability of uh, you know, living longer than that amount of time mm -hmm. uh, under a regimen, which in this case, which stops which says the moment your glucose level goes above, uh, like I think it's seven and a half or something, uh, then uh, we are starting to intensify the treatments to, to bring it down. And so, and the, and so the, the, high, the red one is the one most aggressive. I mean, it's a little small here, as you can see, but, uh, and then the blue one is the least aggressive control of glucose. So the survival is the worst for the least aggressive control. So this is the, what you would have seen in a world if everybody follows this particular dynamic rule for controlling glucose level. And so you're comparing four rules and you see the impact on survival. Very cool. Okay, so let's go in a little more detail about uh, the roadmap, which uh, this whole target learning is based on. So the first step is you describe the experiment, right, involving uh, the description of the data, uh, you write down your likelihood, uh, then you specify your statistical model, meaning what do you know about your, your data distribution, right? The, like the conditional probabilities of the next variable given the past. What do you know about all of them? That's a statistical model. You also have to define your estimate. That's the statistical query. That's where you usually go through this, this kind of special roadmap on the site, which starts defining like uh, working with causal models or full data models where you define your target full data quantity of interest and then do the identification and then in that way establish an estimate which we, which takes into account all the complexities of the data and accurately approximates your causal 
quantity of interest under specified assumptions. And then you have to decide for yourself if these assumptions are reasonable enough. And then you could do a sensitive analysis at the end to, to investigate more this, the impact of these assumptions on the causal gap. Then step four is to construct an estimator. And step five is to obtain inference. So this is all the normal way of traditional statistical theory. Uh, however, in the practice of statistics, uh, people deviate immensely from this, uh, even though these are the foundations of statistics. So let's have a running example. This concerns three multinational randomized control trials, assessing the impact of steroids on mortality among septic patients. Uh, this is actually uh, based on real world uh, data. This is, was a study done by uh, Romain Paraccio. Uh, this involved looking at past trials. People had, uh, they were interested in the question if steroids can help septic patients. So in other words, instead of giving them only antibiotics, maybe we should also give them steroids when they come in very sick. And then the outcome is like one month later, are they surviving? Did they survive? And of course, when they come in, you have these kind of all these variables you can collect. <coughs> And in all these trials they did, they couldn't determine that it had any good effect. And in fact, they ended up doing 32 randomized trials. Uh, so even a meta-analysis of these randomized trials couldn't find a significant effect. And it suggests there is a gain in survival by using the steroids, but the minor and it's not significant. And uh, then uh, you can focus on the three big RCTs in that collection of trials. And again, you can also do meta-analysis there, and then again, it's not significant with standard methodology. Okay, so if we think of this as an example for us, then we say, okay, we, here we have a data set of uh, 1,300 adults. Uh, we collect covariates W, including biomarkers. Then the person gets assigned the treatment, steroid or no steroid, and then we can find out mortality after one month. So we have this W, then comes A, then comes Y. You can think of this as a, you can put down a causal model, right? We have a so-called structure equation model where W is first generated and A is a, a function of W and exogenous errors, and then Y is a function of A and W and exogenous errors. And the structure equation would then allow you to also evaluate of the defined potential outcomes, which is what would the outcome Y have been if A would be one, what would have been the outcome being if A is zero, right? And, and, and so define then your causal quantity, for example, as an, as an uh, average treatment effect. So that's in fact what we will do. But you can look at other uh, causal qualities than that one, but that's just an example. So after you have specified the data, you have kind of to decide on the ordering of the data, the time ordering, and then you the way you write down your likelihood, which is first the distribution W, then the A give, treatment given covariates, and then outcome death given treatment and covariance. Then you have to say, what do I know about these conditional distributions? And so that's where you see a big difference between a paramedic model approach, which would say, I'm going to assume that this probability of death uh, given the treatment and the covariance uh, follows a logistic regression model. You, uh, we are saying, no, no, that we don't know that. So we are not going to make any assumptions like that. The only thing we might assume, in this case at least, is that the conditional probability of treatment given the cohorts is well understood because it follows this randomized trial. So that knowledge isn't used, and that's about it. And so that's your statistical model that defines your set of possible probability distribution of the data. Then after having defined what you really, this, what is the set of possible densities of the data, right here, then uh, you also need to decide what feature of the data distribution do you care about. Now, different in a parametric model, you can see you have your so-called coefficients, but here we don't have that. So we really need to define what we call a mapping psi, which is a mapping from the probabilities of the data to like the real line. It, 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 it's doing nothing else than saying, if I give you the true data distribution, what is the thing you want, what's the number you're looking for. And so that's the psi of p mapping, that's entire parameter mapping, and uh, that needs to be defined. <coughs> so in this case, we could say we define it by going through this exercise, like for example, defining the average causal effect, and then do the identification, and then you find out that if you're willing to assume that the treatment is randomized within every straight of w, meaning that treatment is independent of the 
potential outcomes, y0 and y1 given w, then the average treatment effect is given by this estimate. Uh, so that's an identification result. And of course, in this randomized trial, this will be true. So the, and the estimate is described as follows. You say, calculate the probability of death in every strata w under treatment and control. Take these two probabilities of death under treatment and control, take the difference, uh, and then average over the strata. Uh, it's the probability distribution of w. And so that is then your estimate. And that it can then be interpreted as a causal, a fair average causal effect under our assumptions. So that has now, now by now we have defined our statistical estimation problem. We have our statistical model and we have our statistical target parameter psi. So now the next question becomes how do we construct an estimator? An estimator is an a priori specified algorithm. So you need to come up with an a priori specified algorithm which has good statistical properties for um, estimating this target estimate. Now that's where target makes like it uh, follows an and, and general approach. Uh, the first thing it does, it studies this target parameter, uh, which, uh, you know, the psi of p. You can think of that, that's just a particular uh, functional of densities. You can evaluate so called pathwise derivative of that. You can see how it changes along paths going through p. And, 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 and so you do so called psi of, uh, you know, p epsilon minus psi p divided by epsilon, where p epsilon is a path through p. And as epsilon moves, it moves away from p. In all kinds of directions, so these paths have certain scores. You calculate the derivative, so the dd epsilon of psi of p epsilon, uh, and, and then you, uh, because of the Ries representation theorem, you can represent it as a covariance of a function of your data structure O and uh, the score of your path. And, and that's, uh, yeah, that's because these pathwise derivatives, they are linear in the scores. So when you have a linear real valued mapping on a Hilbert space, the scores live in a Hilbert space. Uh, you also, that linear mapping has a so called gradient, and in particular, a canonical gradient, which happens to is then in the space of scores. Anyway, that canonical gradient, that's also called the efficient impulse curve. It's the object which defines efficient estimators according to efficiency theory. So, the best possible estimators, as a topic, are estimators which satisfy that the estimator minus the true estimate. Uh, equals the empirical mean of that canonical gradient, which is some function of OI, that's always the unit data structure, plus something remainder, but that remainder then goes to zero, uh, even when you multiply it with square root sample size. So that the whole thing goes to a normal distribution after scaling uh, with mean zero and uh, variance, the variance of the canonical gradient. So the question is, how do you construct efficient estimators? Now, target mix like it does that. And among the methods which do construct efficient estimators, such as the one-step estimator and estimating equation methodology, it is truly the uh, estimator which has the most, uh, which is following the best approach. Uh, and uh, because of various reasons. You know, one, it's a substitution estimator, which the others are not. And that really helps a lot with uh, the robustness. It's, and it's really a generalization of maximum like estimation, which is on heavily celebrated method for good reasons, uh, except you don't want to rely only on parametric models. So this, this inherits all these good properties, uh, but actually is now, can now be used for general statistical estimation problems. So the first thing <coughs> uh, it does, it constructs an estimator of the density of the data. In this case, all we need is the conditional probability of death given the treatment and the covariates, and then we also need the marginal distance of the covariates, but we use the empirical mean for that, so that's the easy part. So we don't have to do anything there. But we do have to estimate the conditional probability of death given the treatment and the covariates. So we use their super learning, uh, and then uh, that becomes then, and then we come up with that path through the super learner, which is just a little uh, logistic regression model, which you just offset the logit of the super learner fit, and adds a clever covariate, so it's us plus epsilon, epsilon is the coefficient, times this clever covariate, uh, which is chosen in such a way that this logistic regression model, that the score of that epsilon is actually gives you the canonical gradient. And so the canonical gradient implies this so-called least favorable path, and that's the path we need to use for the TMLE update. So once we have this path, we just do a little maximum likelihood, which is in this case just logis universal logistic regression, using the offset, and then you get an updated uh, prediction. And these updated predictions, the so-called target predictions, 
they are the ones we are now going to plug in into our estimate uh, to define our uh, to get our plugin estimate. Now these team Lee estimators they are uh, optimal and they are plug they're plugin estimates they're efficient they're unbiased and they're finite sample robust. So when you apply this to this particular example you end up with uh, you can see that we are actually succeeding now by just using more efficiently all the data. We do get a significant result with these three RCTs uh, and, uh, and a suggestion of a 20% reduction with a, a confidence interval which is narrow enough that it's statistically uh, significant. On top of, uh, and the inference follows because these estimates behave like a sample mean of the canonical gradients, and which shows the efficient loss function. And therefore, the inference follows naturally once you have implemented the team lead. In this case, there's actually, you can also here see the impact of doing targeting. You start with a sampling distribution, which is too biased. And then by doing the team lead, you shift it to be a nice center distribution. In general, when the initial estimator, in this case, we use highly depth lasso, so then it's already very nicely normally distributed. But for a normal machine learning algorithm, typical machine learning algorithms, it's not even normal. So you then also see it becomes more normal behaved. Uh, in this study, this, this particular example with these three uh, RCTs, there was actually something very interesting going on, uh, which shows that the real question of interest was, uh, what is the optimal dynamic treatment for treating patients? Because it happens to be there is a binary covariate, which is a stress response test. And if a subject is a responder, the steroids is actually bad and it hurts your survival. If you're a non-responder, then the steroids is actually good and it helps you. So there were really two groups in there and there's a rule which is optimal. And the rule is to measure that binary response indicator at baseline and then make your treatment decision based on that. And then that would have uh, you know, immediately found uh, significant results and a very strong, actually correct recommendation in this case. And again, this can stunt stuff we do with targeted learning. We have these a priori specified algorithms which first learn the rule the best fit of the optimal rule and then actually does say hey that's my question of interest let me now do the team lead for that and then it does it in a cross-validated team lead way so that the inference is correct and the, the bias due to double using of the data is actually correct before and so you would have found this then okay so uh, the last few minutes I will just quickly the super learner right the idea is we have a library of algorithms we have, an, uh, we have an internal competition based on cross-validation. And so you train your algorithms on 9 tenths of the data, you evaluate them on the left out subjects, and you, and you figure out who does the best in a tenfold way. And that you can use that to choose the best algorithm. You can also choose the best weighted combination of the algorithms. So that's, uh, uh, that's called super learner. It has super theoretically supported by the Oracle inequality, which tells us that it's asymptotically equivalent to the Oracle selection which just grabs the algorithm, which is truly close to the truth. Uh, you see the power of SuperLearner, for example, you were 15 data sets, and you can see that for different data sets, it selects different algorithms. And uh, the winner across the 15 data sets is the SuperLearner, and then the discrete SuperLearner, which just grabs the best one instead of the convex combination. And then if you look at elements like uh, algorithms in the library, for example, BART is an excellent algorithm, but in one data set, it didn't do well, and then the cross validation will actually still select something else at that moment. So then in the end, BART has been very helpful for the library, but you know when it's not performing well, it's just not used. And that's where, why the super learner outperforms any of these algorithms in its library. Uh, highly adaptive Lasso is a machine learning algorithm we developed, which uh, guarantees us that it, the super learner has this rate of convergence, which is as good as n to the minus one third. And the only assumption you have to make is that your the functions you are learning are right continuous left hand limits and have finite variations. So this is a very powerful result. Guarantees us that our our machine learning algorithm, super learner, performs can learn the truth. You still throw in all these other algorithms. So if they are better for finite samples, they will be chosen. But either way, you are now asymptotically guaranteed that your estimator is efficient and is optimal and everything. It's also actually a very powerful algorithm in finite samples. You know, just some simulations comparing it with gradient boosting. And uh, we actually also use HAL nowadays. Uh, we're starting to use it for the, at the meta learning level so that we are not only choosing the best algorithm or the best weighted combination, we even find the best functional combination 
of the algorithm. So at the meta level, we start using highly adaptive loss. So as a very powerful way to combine all these estimates and even get more powerful algorithms, and you, even more powerful than the regular superlearn. So it's still superlearn, but very aggressive. So here's is in kind of a demonstration what the idea of TML is. Uh, for example, we have looking here at two ways of updating the initial superlearner fit for the average treatment effect. One path uses a wrong clever covariate. The other path uses the right clever covariate. And what do you see? That if you, for every change in the likelihood, so as the likelihood is in, increases, you see that the change in the estimate for the green one is very small, right? While the change in the estimate for the red one, which is the correct path, is very large, it's very steep. So it's that, that for the change in the estimate per increase in likelihood, that's what matters for the choice of this path used in the team least step. And you want it to be maximal. You want it to be maximally steep. And that's exactly what the least favorable path is. And in this, that means that every little fitting you do it for increasing the likelihood gets translated into and change in the estimate. And that's why, even though they end up with similar increases in likelihood, one really nils the average premium effect, the other does not, because it wasn't targeted for that particular estimate. And that's why team link is so powerful. Okay, here we can see simulations where we data adaptively set where we actually randomly sample data distributions, sample data from it, and then run the TMLE uh, with Hull and with the super learner. And so completely blind, completely honest, and you can still see that we get coverage and this goes up to dimension 10. Uh, so it's uh, remarkable how robust uh, this algorithm is once, and certainly when you include highly adaptive loss. So if you don't do that, yeah, you can still see quite a, you know, worse performance because it does matter how good your initial estimator is and how helps a lot. And I'm going to stop here uh, because I think I went over time. And I'm essentially, most of it, the talk has me finished. The slides are available for you. So of course you can, uh, the last few slides, uh, you can look at it for yourself. And some remarks about adaptive uh, designs where we also use TMLE and, and uh, for online super learner and that type of stuff. Sure. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is just clarification around TMLE's relation to normality. Uh, TMLE's relationship with what? Uh, to normality. Yeah. So uh, so when you are interested in certain features of a data uh, distribution, like a density of the data, like a prediction function, right? Like the, for example, you don't care about the whole function. Uh, the probability of death is a function of treatment and COVID, but you only care about the average treatment effect, which is a particular feature of that function. Uh, then if you just do a machine learning algorithms and you plug them in, so you, you use your favorite machine learning algorithm or the super learner to get these predictions and you evaluate these predictions for every subject and the treatment and control, take the difference and average, so that's the plug-in estimator without the TMLE, then that estimator will generally not be normally distributed, not asymptotically normally distributed. And, uh, and it will also have a bias which doesn't disappear. So when you, so even when you bootstrap, for example, the bootstrap is not theoretically valid anyway, but it also wouldn't give you the coverage you want. However, if you do the TMLE, then it actually has the property that it's so-called asymptotically linear estimator. That means suddenly the TMLE, the plug-in estimator, just by this minor update of these predictions, now the plug-in estimator set for the average human effect minus the true average human effect behaves like an empirical mean of a canonical gradient, which is just a particular function of the unit data structure, WI, AI, YI, plus a remainder, which now goes away faster than spirit sample size. And so that's, that's why you get these, uh, this one. Yeah. Um, and if we have that the estimator is normal, then we can leverage so many of our statistical inference tools. Exactly, and that's the key. That in the whole idea of inference is about that you can estimate the sampling distribution of your estimator, and mm -hmm. that is often not possible for typical things. But because of the t like typical machine learning based estimators, but if you do TMLE, you can. That's theoretically does follow approximately a normal sampling distribution, and also with a mean which can be is just as the, yeah is is accurate so that we don't have to worry about estimating a bias we only have to estimate the variance of the estimate now, estimation of the variance of the estimate is very doable right there are all kinds of methods for that in particular with 
TMLE, you can immediately, you get the so-called efficient image curve. So you just take the sample variance of the efficient image curve and you provide inference as if it's a sample mean. And that's one way to get inference. And there are methods which are more finite sample oriented, like bootstrap based methods. So we also have proposed them. But either way, uh, exactly right. We are now having inference by just getting an accurate estimate of the variance. And uh, I'm sure part of the reason why certain research um, or research studies that have depended on just pure ML estimators may not have been 100% accurate because they have been able to leverage those same statistical inference tools because they yeah. build normality. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. And that's also why, for example, if you still see, see things like in machine learning, like random forests, you know, is, is a pretty popular algorithm. One of the reasons is because it has this so-called variable importance measure, right? Where, where you can miss, it, it, it follows the importance of every variable on the outcome, how much it helps you with prediction. Uh, but it's not, it, it is going for particular target estimates, right? That is that variable importance. It measures how they change in like an R square or a change in uh, predictive power uh, due to leaving out that variable or not. Now, that is a formally defined estimate. However, because of the random forest just being, you know, plug-in, uh, it doesn't have any theory. And that's why the so-called p-values they report, they're not p-values and the constant law are not constant laws. Uh, but if you do this with TMLE, then you would have valid inference. So you would be able to say, yeah, the effect of this variable is this and the t-statistic is this and the constant law is that. And so that's the power uh, you get by just doing that TMLE. And it's relatively speaking, you know, if you already have done the machine learning, the team Lee is the relatively trivial task, right? Because it's just a paramedic model fit. So computationally, there's no reason not to do it. And theoretically, there's a lot of reason to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you already touched upon this, but you said that the team Lee provides an unbiased estimator. Yeah, unbiased in the sense, it's not, like, unbiased estimates essentially don't exist, right? For most parameters, they are non-linear parameters of the data distribution. So unbiased, they're never completely unbiased. But there are, what you can hope for is that your estimator is asymptotically linear. And that means it's almost unbiased. The bias is smaller than one over square root sample size. Meaning that the bias relative to the standard error goes to zero. And when the bias divided by the standard error goes to zero, that means for inference, you can ignore it. Right? And you can already show that if the bias, for example, smaller than 10 times the standard error, even when you ignore the bias completely in your Combs interval by only involving the variance, like a typical ball type Combs interval, the coverage is already right on if you get the variance right. So you can see that there's not much needed. You just need that bias to be smaller than the standard error by a factor of 10 or more in your business. Now, that's guaranteed by using team -like. And so that's why suddenly for the inference, the bias becomes negligible. Awesome. Um, and I have one more question. Um, I wanted to identify the role of the super learner versus um, the TMLE. If the TMLE learns a parametric model of the um, underlying probability distribution of your data, what does the super learner do? So I think I think the question here is <laughs> maybe I'm getting it wrong, but for example, when you do TMLE, you could of course use a parametric model as your initial estimator. Right, of the data distribution, like in the, for the average human effect, you could say I'm going to still fit my my uh, probability of death as a function of the treatment and the covariance with a logistic regression, and then still do the TMLE, right? Uh, and what you can, the formal theory of the TMLE says uh, is, is very clear. There is this exact remainder we can calculate. So once you have our target estimate, we can calculate the canonical gradient of that estimate viewed as a functional of the data distribution and then we can also compute its so-called exact second order remainder uh, that's something we it's just the second order term in the tail expansion but it's exact so that term can be defined it's in any of my papers you see it all over the place and that can be computed for every estimation problem and for example for the average treatment effect it's given by the integral of the propensity score estimator minus truth time divided by the propensity score times the outcome regression estimator minus the true outcome regression averaged over all strata with respect to the true distribution. So you see it's a product of two differences integrated, and that has to be smaller than one over square root of sample size. And if you just use a parametric model, right, for your initial outcome regression, and that is going to be inconsistent. So then the propensity score can still save you, right? Because then there's still this other difference in 
that remainder. And uh, But that's why you want to work hard on both. You want to get both the outcome regression and the propensity score, do a good job on them, because then it gets smaller and smaller. And only doing the targeting step correct uh, is, generally speaking, helps a lot, but it's not going to guarantee the possibility of linearity. You really need to work hard, and that's why we still need the machine learning. We need the super learning to get us close enough to the true data distribution. Uh, and, and for general problems, that's absolutely necessary. There are many problems. They have the so-called double robust structure. So that's where you can, there are situations where like in the average field effect, where you could get the outcome regression completely wrong, but because you get the propensity score right with a good algorithm, like highly data was so, you can still be efficient and still be uh, asymptotically. But that's, uh, but anyway, that's not in general true. That's just true for all these so-called double robust estimation problems, where you, you're kind of getting, you might get a lucky break. But generally speaking, even then you want to invest in your super learner and do a good job because it helps you with efficiency. What was that term again? A Dover learner estimator? Uh, which double robust estimator did I say? Oh. Or? Yeah, double robust. There we go. Yeah, double robustness. It's, it means that you can, when you do the TMLE, you have to, uh, there's usually like something for the targeting step, you need like a censoring mechanism, like a hazard of censoring or, or for example, a propensity score for the treatment uh, assignment mechanism. And, and then for the actual, you know, for the target round, you only care about the outcome regression. But nonetheless, you need these other factors of the likelihood, even though they're really not related to your target round, you need them for the targeting step. And so, and in many of these problems, any of these kind of sensor data or causal inference problem, you have a so-called double robustness going on, meaning that the target maximum likelihood estimator is still consistent, even when you get the initial outcome regression wrong, as long as you get the propensity score uh, and the missingness mechanism right. And that's referred to often as double robustness. But that's, uh, uh, that, yeah, that's great. That's nice. But the real issue here is that the remainder term in this TMLE expansion has this cross structure, integral of like a propensity score estimator minus truth times outcome regression estimates minus truth. And that's a beautiful structure because there's a lot of cancellation going on there. There's a lot of plus uh, terms and negative and they, they sum up and they, a lot of cancellation. And that's what's the powerful thing about these kind of uh, statistical estimation problems, that you get such a great remainder. Uh, and, yeah, and then also theoretically, it, show, it demonstrates that you can actually completely misspecify one of them and still be lucky, and still be and still nil your, es your estimate. Well, Professor, that was a very, very informative talk. Um, I want to thank you, Professor, for coming to talk today. Um, and I want to thank you, the audience, for joining us. To see more free content like this, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. Bye.